thankful for all that God has done for us and just thankful to be able to stand here this morning and look in the Word of God. It's just a blessing. I thank God daily that He allowed me to pastor a church. I don't take it lightly. It's not anything that um, I take for granted. Uh, I'd say probably at one point in time in my life I did take that for granted. And when you quit becoming a pastor, you just realize how much you need to be a pastor if the Lord's called you to that ministry. It's hard to not be a pastor when God's called you to be one. And I just want you to know before we get into this message this morning, I love you. I appreciate you. But this is not going to win friends and influence people this morning, I'm just telling you, before we get into it. But it'll be all right. Um, the Lord laid a message of unity on my heart. And uh, you might ask, why? But I believe as a pastor, the Lord whispers things in the pastor's ear to be able to alert to impending danger that could come into a church. And, you know, um, you have to be vigilant and you have to be aware so you can warn the sheep of the dangers to come. And I told you all Wednesday night, sometimes I'm on the other side of being extreme about things that come into this church. But I figured if I'm extreme, the likelihood of things coming into the church to damage the church will be very low. Uh, but that's why I'm extra vigilant with my home. I'm extra vigilant with the church. And that might mean I might keep out some good things from time to time. But Lord help me, I'm not going to put any bad things in by being that way and being ultra strict. Um, so I think Satan, he, he seeks to scatter the flock. And at times when our church, is, we're planning some major steps going forward. We're planning on some major growth going forward. And that's what the church as a whole is seeing um, the, the potential and the capability of us to be able to go forward and I said the church met my need uh, that I was going to have starting in January when the church has voted to increase my pay and I don't take that as uh, you, you saying we're, we're going to do that because we have confidence in the pastor and I hope you do but really we have confidence in what the Lord's going to do and how he's going to grow and the provision he's going to make and that's, that's where our mind should be focused on what he's going to do um, and, and through us as a church. And uh, he would like nothing more than to divide us as we seek to grow. But God's not a God of division. He's a God of addition and he's a God of multiplication. He said be fruitful and multiply. He said to increase. He it is not a God that wants us to be satisfied with the status quo. But there's a lot of churches that don't want to grow because with growth comes growing pains. And growth comes friction. And uh, I think I heard one preacher say that as the church grows you have to clean it more. And that means that uh, you have to have more focus. You have to have more attention. And that means that you have to do more and you have to buy more and, and that's all part of it. It's all part of growth that comes when a church grows. There are things that happens uh, that will cause friction to happen. It will cause pressure to happen. It will cause division to happen if you're not careful. So you might remember the first um, message that I ever preached to this church was called a unified bride. And the idea was to bring us together as, as focused and as one mind and one accord going forward to be able to do the work of God. And that's where my heart's at this morning. So if you have your Bible, if you flip over to the book of Philippians, the book of Philippians, we're going to look at Philippians chapter number 1 and just only one verse this morning. Philippians chapter 1 verse number 27 When you find your place, if you'd stand your feet for honor and reverence of the reading of the Word of God. You might have a title or, a, or something over this passage that says, Exhortation to Steadfastness. And, uh, you know, as we think about this church at Philippi, this church was a good church. It was a church that supported Paul, and it was a church that was a focused church, and it was a working church, and it was a church that supported missionaries. So what we're seeing here from Paul uh, as he's writing the Philippians is not to chide a church as not doing the right thing. It's to encourage and try to make sure that as this church goes forward and does the right thing, it stays tight and focused for what God would have them to do. So Philippians 1 and 27, it says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. This morning I'm going to preach a message to you entitled this, It Only Takes Two. It Only Takes Two. And we're going to see what that means here in just a minute. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for the people that are here. We thank you for the opportunity to look into your word, God. We 
No, Lord, that I don't have what people need this morning. If I did, I'd just give it to them and we'd be done, God. But we know, Lord, that you do, Lord. And as we've said before, the only perfect part of this message this morning is your word. God, we're flawed. We're carnal, Lord. We can't preach this in the perfection that your word's written in. But, God, we pray you'd help us this morning, Lord, in our meager attempt, Lord, to be able to, uh, Lord, communicate, Lord, to the people here this morning, Lord, the way that you've laid it on our hearts. Help us, God, this morning. We ask this all in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. You can be seated. So the purpose of this letter was Paul was offering sincere thanks to the church at Philippi to, uh, for supporting him in their missionary endeavors. And one of the things Paul addresses is unity in the church. They were a strong church. They were, unif they were strongly unified. But what Paul was trying to say is that even though you're unified, you could be even stronger. You could be even more unified. You could be even more uh, focused on each other and even more tight in your endeavors to do what God would have you to do. So the first thing that I want you to notice in the Word of God here this morning is Paul's directive where he says, Only let, only let your conversation be, become at the gospel of Christ. Only let, so only, whatever happens, make this your chief purpose. Conduct yourselves worthy of the gospel. He was speaking in political terms uh, to be a good citizen in the kingdom of God. In other words, make sure you're fulfilling your duties and your obligations. And as I think about this, I, I ask myself a question. If he's talking about being a good citizen and he's speaking in political terms, then my question would be, what is it that, that, it, that it means to be a good citizen? I, what is it to be a good citizen? How do you be a good citizen? What does it mean to be a good citizen? So when we look at ourselves in America, we might say a couple of different things. We might say that a good citizen uh, participates in the community. Uh, that a good citizen focuses on what it, what it is that they should do. That they're participating in the community. Uh, that they're part of something. That they're focused on what's going on uh, out in the world. And I might say that a good a citizen of the church is focused on what's going on in the house of God. They're, uh, they're, they're participating in what we do as a church. They're participating. They got their hands in the fire. Uh, they got their hands in the work. They're doing the thing that they ought to do inside the church. Uh, can I tell you this morning that many people don't want to be a good citizen inside the church because they don't want to be a member of the church because it requires them to do something in the church rather than just sit in the seat of do nothing and just ride the pine and do what they're doing. Can I tell you my friend that that is a very bad approach to take to a church to say I don't want to get involved in anything because if I join that church and I become part of those people then suddenly they're going to ask me to do things. Well shame on you friend to think that way because it should be a joy to do things for God. It should be a joy to get involved in the house of God. It should be a joy to be asked to be part of children's church. It should be a joy to be asked to be part of the nursery. It should be a joy to be asked to do something for the Lord uh, because He's letting us do something. It's not that you have to do it, but God is allowing us uh, to do that on this side of eternity and we should take it as great joy. So I would say a good citizen uh, participates in the community and a good citizen would also volunteer in the community. So I'd say that they're a good volunteer uh, that when things come up, they don't shrink down. Uh, they don't cross their arms. They don't drop their head. They're not saying to themselves, uh, I don't want to get involved or maybe somebody else will do it or somebody else can participate in it. Uh, they don't want to get involved if you're not a good citizen because you, that you know it's going to take time. And I thought to myself, man, uh, bless me to God that I would be like Brother Kenneth and, and be willing to be here at 2 o'clock in the morning uh, to do what God would have me to do, to walk in at 2 o'clock in the morning and do this is great dedication and it's great commitment and it's something that not all of us would want to do even the pastor and when we think about that uh, what a blessing that it would be my friend uh, to be to have a heart to say I just want to serve God and no matter what kind of inconvenience no matter what it takes me to do I want to do it for God to be a good citizen I would say a good citizen participates in the community a good citizen volunteers and helps uh, but also a good citizen is informed they know what's going on in the world and if you don't know what's going on in the Bible my friend then you can't depend on me to preach it to you and you can't think I'm just going to show up on Wednesday and hope the pastor gives me enough uh, to get me through what's going on and maybe the pastor will give me enough on Sunday uh, that my friend if you're not in this old book right here by yourself during the week I can't possibly give you everything that you need on Sunday morning. I can't preach enough to be able to get you what you need in the word of God uh, that if the Bible is the bread of life and I know that it is because the word says that uh, then that means you need to be in it every single day of your life getting your own chomp of this bread right here 
here, uh, getting your own saturation in there, uh, sopping it up with a biscuit, my friend, to see that this is the bread of life. Uh, this is what will get you through the day. Uh, this is what will get you through the week. This will get you through your hard times. And if you're just dependent on the pastor to be able to get you through that, uh, then you are really a sore mistaken because uh, my job is to preach the word to you, but your job is to be a good steward of the word, to get in here, read and study, to show uh, thou self approved a workman unto God. Uh, so you get in the word every day. You study to show yourself approved. You make sure that you know what says the scripture and you've got to be informed about what's going on in here. Right. Amen. Amen. Well, preacher, I would love to, I would love to ask you questions through the week, but you're not going, I, I don't want to bother you. Friend, if you bother your pastor by asking him a question, then you need to get a new pastor. Amen. Amen. It don't bother me a bit for you to ask me a question. My job is to feed the sheep. And if I'm too busy through the week that I can't take a minute to feed the sheep, uh, then I've got a problem, my friend, uh, because my job is to feed the sheep and to protect the sheep and watch for the sheep. And if I get into a situation where I, it, it gets on my nerves that you ask me a question about the Bible, uh, then you need to go find you a pastor that's not so busy, a pastor that has more time for his flock because my job as a pastor should be focused on you and what you need. And if it bothers me for you to ask me a question... Uh, uh, then, I, then I need to bump this old-fashioned altar myself. Ask me a question. Ask me what I think about this or what does this scripture mean. You're not going to bother me at all. But we'll use that as an excuse why I don't want to bother you. How courteous of you. It's just really laziness, if I might just say it. It's just really laziness. You don't want to ask. You don't want to know. And in the world of Google... You can find lots of answers to a lot of things and find you a couple of trusted sources and that be something you go to. And then ask counsel of your pastor and ask counsel of the deacons and to see if what you've read actually lines up with the Word of God. So we see, uh, I would say also, a good citizen takes responsibility. Takes responsibility. When you're wrong, you say you're wrong. When you do something uh, incorrectly, you, you say you did it incorrectly. And then you take what you're supposed to do in the house of God and you take responsibility for that. You don't try to shove it off on somebody else. Uh, you don't try to figure out why somebody else could do the work. Uh, but you take responsibility. You get involved and you say, it is my responsibility to see this through. It's my responsibility to make sure that this is going on. Uh, that God has entrusted me to this and I'm going to be responsible uh, for what the God has given me. But I would also say uh, a good citizen participates in the community violence volunteers is informed, uh, takes responsibility, but also respects the property of others. Now on the surface, you might think to yourself, well how, what does it mean to take responsibility, to, to, to be res uh, respect the property of others? That means to respect the property of the church house, because this is God's property. This is not my church. This is not your church. This is God's church. I might say this. To respect the property of others means take your property with you when you leave here. Yeah, man, preacher, that's good preaching. Don't stack up your stuff in the seat. Listen to me. Y'all all right this morning? You come in here and there's stuff stacked up and there's things going on and there's uh, blankets here and there's, and, there's, and there's hand sanitizer there and there's bags of candy here and there's things going on. That ought not be, folks. Why, why is that? Because when, when people come in to visit and they walk up and they go, well, I don't... I don't I, I, there's 14 blankets over here. I can't really sit there. And, uh, well, there's four Bibles here. I don't know who those belong to. And, uh, well, there's four bags of candy. I don't, I don't really know where I fit in there. Guys, when I leave here in the eat, when I leave here after church, I take the stuff that I have with me to the house. You know why? Because this is God's house. This ain't a place for me to nest in. This ain't a place for me to get comfortable in. This ain't a place for me to kick back and relax in. This is a place, this is the house of God. And my hope is that when people come in, if, if I'm not in here, that they look, they don't think that all these seats are taken because there's a bunch of junk piled up in the seats. Yeah, man, yeah, man preacher. That's good preaching right there, ain't it? I know that don't sound good because I say more than half the church is guilty of this. But the thing is, we got to be focused on the people coming in here. 
Not focused. This ain't a place. Remember, I've said before that a church is not a hotel for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. And you want them to see empty beds when they walk in. You want them to see that there's places for them uh, to be able to be there. That there's not uh, stuff occupying the seat just to occupy the seat. Uh, that we're respecting the property of God. And we say that this is not a place for me to relax. This is not a place for me to nest. This is not a place for me to store my stuff. Uh, this is not a place for me to store my Bibles. This is not a place for me to uh, just hoard up all the stuff. Uh, but this is God's house. And when I leave here... I'm going to take with me what I brought in here. Now I know I'm preaching to my family and I know I'm preaching to your family right there. But sometimes we do that and the reason we do that is we get comfortable in our seats and we get comfortable in the church. There's nothing wrong with being comfortable. Uh, but the idea is the focus that we're trying to reach people for God. But when you nest up, when you nest up and you hoard up, that's like when somebody walks in your house and they go, where do I sit? You know when people walk in your house? Where do you sit at? Where do I sit? As Christians, we should be willing to sit wherever in this church. Wherever a seat's open. Wherever there's opportunity. And not think to ourselves, well, somebody's in my seat. But think, praise God, there's somebody in my seat. Praise God that there's people coming. Praise God that they feel comfortable enough just to sit down anywhere. And, and when I look at respecting the property of others, you're respecting God's house in a way uh, to say, God, this is your place. And one of these days, I'm not going to be here. I don't want my name on the end of the pew to say, Ricky Mullen bought this pew. I know some churches do that and they can do whatever they want to. Uh, but sometimes that becomes some kind of a moniker and some kind of an ownership thing. And I think to myself, ain't none of you own anything in this church. Ain't none of me. I don't own anything in this church. It don't matter that my dad had this note his name, that's not worth a hill of beans. It don't matter that my dad built that house out here and me and him did the That don't matter. You know why? Because it's God's house. It's God's work. It's not mine. It's not yours. It's not his. It's not the founding members. That this is God's work here at this church. And we look at that, we got to respect it like it is God's. We get territorial in a church, but there's friction when churches grow. Well, that's the thing I always did, preacher. Well, I'm the one who bought the drinks. And I'm the one who used to take care of the bathroom. And I'm the one who would hang stuff up on the walls. But it was me who would also make sure that uh, the fellowship hall was this or that. Well, thanks be to God that you did that, but that don't mean it's yours forever, my friend. That the, the hope should be that there's people coming in and you don't have to do that forever. Uh, you can move on to another, another ministry. You can move on to another thing because uh, somebody else can come and take the reins. So we see a good citizen does these things, a life worthy of the gospel, an earthly walk of a heavenly man. Number one, Paul's directive, but also look at Paul's declaration in verse number 27. He said, stand fast in one spirit. Only let your, your conversation be as it becomes the gospel of Christ, uh, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, uh, that ye stand fast in one spirit. Fast in one spirit means to keep your ground in battle. In one spirit is harmony without bickering, without contention. And you might say, well, what is contention? Contention is unspoken disagreement. Unspoken disagreement. God sees it even if you don't say it. God knows how you feel about one another, even if you're not willing to say how you feel about one another. So, this, so you think to yourself, I don't like brother so-and-so, I don't like sister so-and-so, and, and but I don't ever say anything. But God says, I don't want any unspoken disagreement. So, you know why you don't like some people in church? Because they act like you. <laughs> yeah, man! They do things like you, and you get to see what the rest of us see. And that bothers you. Some of the people I met in my life I dislike the most act like I do. And I don't like that. Because I want to act like I do, but I don't want you to act like I do. Because I get on my nerves when I see it in real life. So this, why do you not like, why do some church members not like the other church members? Because they're too much alike. They butt heads. They do things the same way. They, they're strong-minded. They're strong-willed. And when I get around people that's wired like that, I butt heads with them the entire time I'm around them because they act like I do. And God shows me a mirror of who I am. And that bothers me because then you can just see how carnal you are. You can see how prideful you are. You can see how 
lazy you are. You can see all the things about yourself that you don't want to see. So when we see this one spirit without bickering, without contention, stand fast means you've got to stand your ground in battle. And you can't stand your ground in battle if you're fighting with somebody standing next to you. That, and we'll get to that just here in a second. I'm getting, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. So we see here Paul's declaration, but then number three, Paul's demand in verse number 27. He said, striving together with one mind, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. It goes further than being without contention. It goes into being one mind. Shoulder to shoulder, side by side, heart to heart, joined up. This word striving here in the Greek is where we get the word for athlete. It means cooperation and coordination toward a common enemy. When you're on an athletic team together, you have the same opponent. You're not fighting each other. You have an enemy. You have an opposing team. If you're fighting with one another, you're not going to be very effective at, at, at facing the enemy. Ephesians 6.12 says this, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I don't really care for so and so. It's not them, my friend. It's Satan that you're fighting against. Don't mistake that. Don't mistake that. You wrestle not against flesh and blood. If we're supposed to have a common enemy together, how effective can I be if I'm trying to fight with my teammate? Satan is a, is, is a strong joker, right? No, you come up here for a second. I'm supposed to be joined up with my church member. A threefold cord's not easily broken, right? I'm supposed to be joined up, and we're supposed to be fighting this, this battle together, me and him going forward with each other. Now, if you fight me by myself, you might get me to get, come back, but I have Noah right here. He's a pretty big old boy, isn't he? He could help me with that, and if I got AJ to join in, I'd be even stronger. If I got some of y'all, I'd be even stronger. So I'm supposed to join up here. How effective would I be against Satan if I'm doing like this right here the whole time? Say, Noah, I tell you what, it's my job, buddy. What are you doing on my face? Why are you, why are you trying to make casserole? It's my job to make casserole. Why are you trying to do that? It's my job to do that. <laughs> What do you think Satan's going to do to us? A house divided cannot stand against itself. You can go have a seat. If I'm fighting with him the whole time, it don't take much. Satan come up and give me a quick throat punch and I'm done. Because I'm not focused on what Satan's doing. You wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Against wickedness in high places. It's Satan that's after you. It's not your brother or your sister. It's Satan working through them to get to you. That applies to everything. It applies to your marriage. You wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. It's not, it's not the person. It's Satan working through, can work through saved people. Because you come up and you have a bad day, you have a bad attitude, you show up with the pooch mouth, and you're upset, and you just don't feel, things don't feel the right way, and you're dissatisfied with your job, and you're dissatisfied with your life right now, and just things ain't going great, and you're tired, and you just don't feel like getting up, and then somebody walks up to you and says, are you feeling okay? And you're like, yeah, I'm feeling okay. Why don't you just try to raise a baby? Why don't you do that and see how you feel? And, and that little quick thing right there might cut them to the quick and hurt them because that you let your attitude get ahead of yourself. And when we look at this, Standing fast together, shoulder to shoulder. But preacher, I don't really like so and so. Now you say, don't, don't tell me they ain't too, there ain't anybody in here that don't dislike the other person because God would not have me preach this if that was the case. All right? I don't think I'm preaching to a bunch of uh, ha 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 in harmony people. <laughs> We're human beings. We don't always get along with each other. You just don't. There's going to be days that somebody just rubs you the wrong way. That's how life works. So when we see here, but preacher, I don't really like so-and-so, but I like everybody else. I don't think it's a big deal uh, that I just don't like this one person or, or I don't get along with this one person. I just stay out of their way and I don't really want to talk to them a whole lot because if I do, I get aggravated. So I'm just going to avoid this person. But, but God don't really care about that because I get along with everybody else. That's a good point, but you're wrong. You're wrong. Flat wrong. Scripturally wrong. How do I know that? Well, I'm glad you asked. 
Flip over to chapter number 4 in Philippians, verse 1 and 2. Philippians 4, 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord. Say that again, my dearly beloved, stand fast. Verse number 2, I beseech you odious and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. You odious and Syntyche were at odds with one another over some kind of matter. So Paul called out just two people. When he looked at the church, he said, I have a problem that you don't like you. Even though the rest of you might be fine, you too can cause a problem for this whole church. You too being at odds. And I think it was pretty important because we have space taken up in the infallible, inerrant Word of God to call out these two women for doing that. You could just fill in, you could fill in anything right there. You can say, Jordan and Ricky, I, I, I commend you to be fast in one spirit. I can say, Jasmine and Donna, be fast in one spirit. You can feel it, and you know, my friend, who in this church that you don't get along with. I don't have to tell you that. But I can see it. I can see it. It's hard to get something past your pastor. Because your pastor was given from the Lord an ability to see the problems in his flock. Because if I didn't, then the enemy could get in. So the pastor is given a, a special, I call it spidey senses, a special kind of discernment that comes from God out of heaven. It has literally never been wrong. Never been wrong. I told Brooke two months ago that that guy that was buying the land, it was not going to work. And I hope to God I was wrong. But I wasn't. You know why I wasn't? Because it wasn't me. It's God. It's discernment from the Lord. He's never wrong. I get it wrong. He's never wrong. And when the Lord gives you a message to say, you better unify. Even if it's two of you, you better unify. Because the enemy, he can start there. And you'll take down Jordan. But if, I take down, if he takes down Jordan, he'll fall around and get Jasmine. Then he'll fall around and get the kids with him. And then he'll fall around and get Beaver. And then he'll fall around and get Donna. And then he'll get Cole. And then he'll get Brooke. And for long, he's got half the church. It's easy because families fall like dominoes when, when Satan comes in. It's easy for that to happen. Because Satan, he, he won't just affect one person. He'll infect your entire family. Because before long, you'll look and say, I can't believe they did that. I'm not going down there if they did you that way. Well, if they did her that way, I'm not going down there. Well, if they do that, then I'm not going down there. And before long, the church splits. So when we look here, just two people. So Christians are friends, not foes. They're co-workers, not competitors. And Christ seeks for us to be a consistent church. You can't be consistent without workers and volunteers. It's impossible. You can't be consistent. Without consistency, we show up and there's no water in there. Because, and I'm not saying this to call anybody out, but they probably wasn't anybody else thinking, I need to get down here and make sure there's water here. Because you just show up and it's there. We take for granted sometimes. And thank be to God that we have somebody doing that. But the consistency comes from their people being willing to volunteer, give up their time, give up, uh, give up the things they want to do to focus on the Lord. We're supposed to be united. You can't be united with contention among the members. We have a common enemy. We have a common foe. You can't be united when you're fighting amongst yourselves. And a zealous church to resist the adversary. And you can't fight the devil when you're fighting with each other. So, we can't do what we're trying to do if we divide. This church is growing rapidly. With rapid growth comes rapid problems. With rapid growth comes rapid contention. This church has quadrupled in size in the last year. That's unheard of. In a time when church membership's fallen off, we see God doing work. I went to Bristol to the Bible bookstore this past weekend, actually this past Friday, and the lady there is familiar with Wise, and I told her, she said, what church are you with? I said, Living Waters Independent Baptist. She said, that is a powerful church in your area. I've heard of it. How did they hear of it? Because of what God's doing. But I don't want them to hear of this and say, man, that church was on fire for God, and then something happened and it just crumbled. 
Everything was going the right way. They were trying to get their pastor to be full time. And the church was growing. There were people joining. And then something happened and it just fell apart. We got to circle the wagons and know that Satan's got a target on your back, Jason, on your back, Penny, on everybody in here because he wants to sow discord. He wants to sow contention. He wants to sow gossip. And you, can I tell you this? Gossip, even if you don't post anything on Facebook, if you read it, you're still participating in gossip. It's still doing something other to you. It's still infecting you. I, I got up on Friday morning. I usually don't. I, I checked my email. No, Wednesday morning. I checked my email before I went to work to see if anybody's buying jam because usually I take a lot with me and sell it at work. And I don't know why, but I happened to see a headline about this guy who, uh, who beat this kid. For the next hour, I was mad at the big devil for no reason. I was rehearsing in the shower what I would do to somebody if they did something to one of my kids. I thought I, I, thought I would do this. And like, I was getting mad, and I was, I, was, I was in there, and I was like, man, I'll tell you what. I would, and I started thinking ungodly thoughts. Like even though it might have been righteous, it was ungodly. Because I thought to myself, I'd do this, and I'd do that, and they'd never find that guy again. Because, you know, and I, and I thought, that, why am I doing that? And I thought to myself, even reading this is doing something to me in, in, internally. So I don't even need to participate and read this. If that's how I internalize this and it makes me mad, what good was it for me to even know this? Facebook posts are the same way. You see what people's doing? You're reading it. You're not doing anything with it. It's still gossip. Most of y'all won't get rid of Facebook because you're nosy. It ain't because you keep up with family. It's because you're nosy. You want to know what's going on. You want to know what houses people are buying and where they're going on vacation and what kind of things they're doing. Pitch the phone to the side for a while and you'll just see how fake everybody is. When we go on vacation, we'll be enjoying scenery and looking at it. I'm like, wow, look at this, look at that. And I'll see a family over here. <laughs> stay, stay right there. Don't you move. And then they post that. And they look happy. And I'm thinking, I have no pictures, but I'm happier than they are. I'm not yelling at anybody to su shut up and sit still and don't do this and don't do that. I see the scenery and then I go on about my life. There's no even evidence that I was there unless you look at a little digital camera that we keep with us that we usually don't even get it out until we get to the, where we're going. We'll take a picture and then we'll leave. But wh why, why am I saying all this? Because you, you curate this stuff online and the stuff you're seeing ain't real anyway. So the nosiness that you see, the gossip you participate in, is not actually real gossip. It's fake, curated. It's like going into a museum. Everything's perfect and shiny and looks good, but it's not reality. That's not the way the world works. There's a lot of happy families out there on Facebook. They got everything together, and then somebody goes, you know so-and-so left their wife? You believe that? Yeah, I absolutely believe it. Because you can see by the way they live their life that what they're on Facebook is not lining up. It don't look good. When they're hanging out all their goods for sale, when they go out without their husband, not really a big surprise to me. Amen. So when just looking at it, just seeing it, is you participating in gossip. And I got rid of Facebook because I realized how bad I did not like other people when I had Facebook. <laughs> when I saw what other people posted, I thought, I don't like them anymore. Instead of me just, hey, the only time I see you is when I see you, and I actually like to talk to you. But if I see what you post on Facebook, I might not want to even talk to you in real life. All that stuff that we think is harmless, it shows contention. It shows strife. When you see what's going on, you can't help but get jealous when everything's going right in somebody else's life. There's some pastors that I like, that they're doing great things. I avoid even looking at them on social media because I start to get jealous of the things they got going on. I do. I'm human. I see what they got going on. I see the ministries they have. Then I thought, I'm just going to listen to them preach get fed by that and then separate myself from this because God's given me a row to plow and I'm going to plow that row and keep focused on that and God will grow it as it needs to grow. So we look at this, it only takes two. Be careful how you interact with each other. Do you want to be the reason that this church doesn't grow? Because it can, it can be we start with one person. One person. I don't know about you, I don't want to be the person. I don't want to be the reason. I don't want to be the person who has their hands all on something and, and can't let go of it. We built 
Brooke and I, well actually mainly Brooke, I'd say 95% Brooke, built our church website. Put a lot of time into it, a lot of effort into it, a lot of stuff into it. And then we gave it to Eric. That was hard. I'm not even going to lie. That's hard to let go of something you created and give it to somebody else because you have some kind of pride. You want to hold on to it instead of saying, God, thank you, thank you there's workers for the vineyard. Thank you there's people willing to do things. And God, I'm going to give it to somebody else and I'm going to go on with something else. Because God, I can't do what you've called me to do effectively if I clinch up on these things that I'm doing. If I hold on to these things I'm doing. Pastors should know what's going on in the church, but the pastor don't have to control everything that's going on in the church. There's got to be other people that does stuff. That allows people to go on and grow. And I thank God that we have people in the church like Brother Jason, Brother Eric, that can do stuff with computers and know how to stream stuff to the back room and know what it takes to do that. And I don't need to be involved in that kind of stuff and, and clinch up on it and say, I want to be involved. I'm glad that we have people like Sister Penny who knows how to go out in the community and can get donations and talk to people. I don't need to clinch up on it and say, well, it's only me that can do that. It's only me that can, uh, that can take care of these things. But thank God that we have people willing to do stuff that can take it and run. I hope one of these days there's a young Willie that comes along. They can make biscuits. Amen. Amen. And a young Kenneth that comes along. They can make casseroles. And they can mow yards. I, that's what we need to do is get to the point to where we say, you can have it. Because God, this is for you. This ain't for me. I'm, I'm not going to grab a hold of these things. Folks, it only takes two. Brother Eric, would you come and help me this morning?